And we're alive, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Electric Podcast. I'm Fred, your host, and I'm joined by Seth Wintraub. How are you, Seth? I'm good, Fred. Thanks. Awesome. Um, we have a lot to discuss this, to discuss this week. Uh, we're starting with the uh, Model 3 production ramp up and uh, the delivery number that came out early in the week and all the controversy that came with those numbers because uh, it didn't play out like I think Tesla thought it was going to play out or specifically Elon Musk thought it was going to play out. If you remember a few weeks back, he, um, he called out uh, that the short interest on Tesla, people that are basically betting against the company right now are going to see their position, I'm quoting, explode in three weeks. And those three weeks, uh, the timing ended up this week when Tesla released those numbers that happened on the, when was it on Monday that the numbers came out? But actually, we, we learned about it uh, during the weekend. Or the weekend, yeah. Yeah, if you uh, follow that track, we, uh, we released uh, an email that Elon sent out to, um, to the employees on the Sunday where he said that they actually hit the 5,000 a week model three production during the last week of the quarter <coughs> excuse me and uh seven thousand total production vehicle production during the week so when you combine model s and x with model three that's seven thousand vehicle which is uh which is pretty good so those number came out on sunday everyone freaked out uh they, they really reach it uh, if you remember the last podcast i was a little bit skeptical that this would actually reach it without like extrapolating uh a last few days of production or something like that but uh he actually said that it was the total factory output during the whole week so that's true i think Seth called it last week <laughs> i mean um, he seemed pretty confident he was kind of strutting yeah, but it does sound that they like they, they barely made it like the last day or or, or so. The because the, uh, the next day the actual number came out, which was five thousand and thirty one model three produced during the last seven days of the of Q two. So that they barely made it. <laughs> yeah, and what is what is that? So just for clarification, what is that called? Uh, he he put a stipulation on on the seven thousand number, like it's factory something. Uh, yeah, that was on the email um, yeah. that came out the day before. What did he call it? He called it. Let's see. Um, it was something factory about factory gate. Factory gate. So yeah, factory that's gate. my understanding is that what exists the factory gate. So it's a factory output. That was my understanding of it. So that's what um, like left the door. Yeah, out of the door. Okay. Um. Other interesting numbers that came out: uh, the total um, production for for the quarter was uh, fifty three thousand three hundred and thirty nine vehicles. So, of that, twenty eight thousand five hundred seventy eight were Model Threes. Uh, the mix, the rest was about fifty fifty for Model S and X. Um, big discrepancy between the uh, production and deliveries during the quarter. Of course, that's partly explained because of the burst of, uh, of production of Model 3 during the last uh, week or so. Uh, only 40, well, oh, I'm, I'm saying only, it's, it's, still a, <laughs> it's still a record by a, by a wide margin, but uh, only 40,740 vehicles compared to that 53,000 uh, produced. And 18,000 were Model 3s. So Tesla delivered 80,000 Model 3s during the, the second quarters, which is big, big improvement versus the previous quarter before. Uh, 10,000 Model S, 11,000 Model X. Um, so Model S and X deliveries a little bit down. Uh, still somewhat where they used to be uh, like a year or so ago. Do you like think that said, was because they shut down the Model S and X lines a few times to get more people on the Model 3? Well, there there were a lot of uh, of comments about uh, from from employees being pushed uh, from the Model S and X production lines, uh, well, production processes and the and the uh, General Assembly line one and two, to the new General Assembly lines and other parts of Model Three production. So yeah, that could be an effect. Um, there was a a report from Reuters that came out saying that Tesla somehow missed uh, the, the Model Three production target, Model S production target, by like eight hundred cars in the last week but that was disproved by Elon Musk and by the, the the statement that Tesla released because they they still produced um 
2000 model s and x combined so unless there's like a very bad mix of model s and x in there which doesn't make much sense in my opinion uh, I, I don't think that was really really an issue but yeah if you if you look at the actual charts now of the even if you don't look at the production you just look at the deliveries even though they were lower uh, uh, much lower than production during the last quarter if you look at all the um, quarterly deliveries of model s X and now Model 3 since the launch of the Model S in 2012. I mean, it looks like a very serious and constant growth from from from, from Tesla here. So all good news basically from from those um from those number. The only but didn't like we said didn't play out as expected from Tesla. Very next day after the 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 number were released, the stock tumbled. Lost about 15 percent since the release of uh, of the, those numbers. So. A lot of confusion. I think for... most of the analysts uh, had problems with the way they got the, to the numbers. Uh, you know, obviously the tent, uh, having people work, you know, twelve-hour days, six days a week. Um, the general consensus is that it wasn't sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, well, that was the view of uh, a friend Levi from uh, CFRA. Who uh, was the like the first, basically the first analyst to comment on those um, uh, on, on the production and delivery numbers? Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was exactly his word that he thinks it's unsustainable or uh, unprofitable. Right, or you know both, I guess. Since yeah, uh, you know they're paying what like if if workers are working sixty hour weeks, they're twenty percent of that is overtime, and that's quite a bit of extra money. I mean, theoretically, they could just hire more people, and I'm sure Tesla is hiring more people. But but you know, for the lines, but um, and you know, like they plan to get to six thousand, so it's not like they're just like, all right, we made it to five thousand. Let's like fix everything up. It looks like they're still trying to expand more. Yeah, well, uh, I think they are looking at the one way because. Even though yes, there's there's a an history from Tesla of making those big bursts at the end of the quarter and then like slowing down for a while. It's a fair criticism, but they they, they miss the big advantage of uh, of doing those bursts. When when you do a burst like that in the production, you you can clearly see the weaknesses in your production process. And then when when you slow down, and they, they did slow down with uh, like a Fourth of July, they they shut down to do some some updates. Well, you can address those weaknesses pretty, uh, w better after you get a production slowdown for a few weeks. So, yeah, I guess it's like uh, if you're about to to take off in an airplane, you want to make sure that it can go full. So you put you know put the pedal to the metal and see how it you know if, if everything just <laughs> sticks together. Yeah, and then no, I guess that's what they're kind of doing here. And then you just generally go up slowly. Yeah. And of course, the the timing l looks weird because of that. Because since the very last day of the quarter, people just can can only see it as Tesla trying to look good for the end of the quarter, which is fair. I mean, that that's that's exactly what it looks like. But that doesn't mean there's no advantages for future production ramp from that. Uh, I don't think that, uh, well. But then that wasn't the only issue. So th th that was like the first reaction from Wall Street, and then then the stock started to tumble because of it. But then other media started getting on board and started to question the validity of uh, of, of the production ramp of the Model Three. Uh, one example was from <laughs> one example that's been very controversial was a, a report from Business Insider based on. Um, on an employees on, on employee on the Model 3 production line, uh, saying that uh, Tesla during the last week during that that last boost of production, Tesla removed the break and roll tests from the uh, manufacturing process of the Model 3, and in that article, the the, the characterized the test as being critical, and it was sort of framed as Tesla re re removing a part of the production process in order to uh, make it quicker and uh get out the product get more car to production during the last week but at the risk of uh affecting quality because of the, the uh, break and roll test affecting the alignment and verifying the alignment of the model, model three of course tesla directly denied the report uh the way they presented it is that it was basically a redundant test. They, they, they figured that uh, since they test the, the vehicle on track, they test every Model 3 on a test track, which is 
uh, where they do the brake test, the torque test, and the, and, and the screw and rattle and everything. I don't think every auto manufacturer does that, do they? That's no, they don't. That's a... Not not every one of them, and that that's why. And also, like the brake and roll test, and and encompass a lot of different things, and it can mean different things for different automakers. Uh, so some automakers even do the emission tests with that. Of mm. course, Tesla doesn't give a damn about an emission test. So, like, you, you, there's definitely ways to 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 not do the test and replace it with something else. And testing every car on a test track is one of those ways. So it does as like Tesla has a good argument of for for removing the test from its production process. But then what happened after that was even weirder. Where that that article came out from Business Insider from um, a reporter there called. Uh, Lynette, 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 Lynette Lopez. Lynette Lopez, who has a, a long history of uh, of making like hit pieces on Tesla, and Elon Musk came down on her. I had never heard of her before this week. I mean, I'm, you know, I just didn't really know her name. Yeah, well, I, I knew vaguely about her. I didn't follow her closely, but I saw I saw a few of her, of her previous um, report. Uh, we 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 knew about her also because of the uh, Martin Trip thing. So right. Martin Trip is the guy that uh, Tesla is suing right now. Who was working at the Gigafactory one, and he, he stole a bunch of uh, data from Tesla and sent it to the media. Uh, one of those, that. allegedly, one of those media was a uh, business insider and was directly uh, Alinette Lopez, and she used it for a report on that. Um, and the other was Kalani of CNBC. Yeah. Uh, so both business insider and CNBC uh, used those um, uh, the data that was uh, obtained illegally by 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 Thrip. Well, allegedly illegally. Anyway, and what was weird about that too is that those media never really disclose after the fact. Like after it was clear that it, it was him, because like it was no doubt about it because they, he admitted it, and then <laughs> it came out in the media, and you knew. Which uh, th those reports came from which media, which media outlets. Mm -hmm. So it was always clear. Then they never acknowledge it or came back to the original article and update it. Like, by the way, uh, we now know that this information came from the disgruntled Tesla employee, but they probably already knew that it was a disgruntled Tesla employee. But yeah, we talked about that last week. And it, yeah. you know, they still have not updated Claudney or Lopez have not updated their uh, stories to reflect that. I I, I would go beyond disgruntled. I'd I'd say he's like kind of a nutso. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the more thing comes out about him, and now he has a social media, he has a Twitter account, and you listen to it, and he's oh, Jesus. He sounds so crazy. Um, just doesn't sound like a stable person. He, calling out Elon Musk directly, saying, "How much are you worth? I'm going for because I'm going for all of it. I'm I'm going to take every penny from you." Like the guy is worth thirty billion dollars. What whatever he has done to you, like let's say he's right and Elon Musk has done terrible thing to him, worth com compensation. What do you think is worth thirty billion dollars? <laughs> crazy Sounds people, like a child. crazy. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so but Elon also maybe like didn't sound uh, exactly like a completely ma mature uh, adult when he, he came down on uh, uh, Lynette Lopez. But of course, if you understand all the background behind it, like Elon is is getting pretty tired of uh, uh, of how he's treated in the media, and how especially Tesla is treated in the media. Yeah, but I mean, Elon and the media go back quite a bit. I was yeah. thinking, like, oh, ever since we've been covering, like there was the uh, um, the tes Tesla Roadster on. Uh, that British television show, Top Gear. Top Gear. I mean, that was a big fiasco. Then mm -hmm. there was the uh, Broadner thing on uh, the at New York Times. You remember uh, that? That was the uh, fake faking the running out of uh, uh, yeah, what, like uh, the cold like thing. Driving, like he, he was driving around a parking lot for a couple yeah. hours. Yeah, and it was on the it was in the thing, and he's like, "Oh, I ran out of electricity," <laughs> you know. Uh, so this is not new. Like I feel like. Uh, I don't know. I just feel like Elon really just hates at this point. He just hates the the media, probably worse yeah. than Trump. Uh, coming back on this specific case here, what 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 Elon did after that report came out because it was sort of like the uh, 
um, the, the cherry on the Sunday here that we, we can go back to all our other reports and there, there are a lot of, oh, we, we, there are a lot of things that we already debunk so it's, it's not the first time but he went a lot deeper after this one so f first of all he claimed that she bribed uh, a Tesla employees a, a former Tesla employee f for uh, getting information for them at first, he didn't specifically said that it was uh, Martin Tripp with the, the scrap metal thing and, uh, and everything else. But uh, later on, he confirmed it. But then Tripp denied that it was paid by, by Lynette. Uh, Lynette never uh, never denied it herself, but the uh, editor-in-chief of Business Insiders sort of said it for her. Well, she didn't say it, but she just she just said that he, we, we're, we we're behind uh, Lynette Lopez and uh, it's our policy not to pay for for sources, right? But the allegations from Elon are that um, the money came from Chanos or some shorts. Yeah, it, it, well, that wasn't clear. He said that she's sort of acting as a proxy for for getting information with Chanos, but like that's two different things. Because either she she's getting she, she's getting paid by Chanos and funneling the money to sources to get the information, and then funneling the, those those information back to Chanos. So that was sort of his claim first. But uh, I mean, there's no indication that Chanos has any like data to. But if you go back to the 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 the, the um, lawsuit against Trip, there's a, mer a mention of a third party that's not necessarily the media that receiving information from. Yeah, where's Trip. all this the data going? You know, they yeah, were, so, they were for data. And uh, if you you guys are not aware of who Chanos, his Chanos is uh, is a hedge fund manager. Um, I think he's even a billionaire at this point, or close to be. Uh, very very rich guy. Uh, his uh, claim to fame were uh, shorting Fairfax, the uh, Canadian insurer, and uh, Henron, the uh, power company, the energy company, uh, which he did successfully to 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 a certain degree, and uh, that made him very popular. And now his latest big shorts are, are is Tesla. So he's um he's shorting Tesla stock, so he gained from Tesla's credibility, uh, Tesla losing credibility, and his stock price decreasing. Uh, sorry, and he actively uh, go after it in the media, go after the company in the media to try to 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 uh, like we said, attack the credibility of the company. We reported on channels a few times in the past because he does that. I mean, it, it's fair. You can have your own criticism of Tesla, and you, you can make money from Tesla stock decreasing. But when you spread misinformation to achieve that goal, that's where I draw the line. And uh, in the past, he did like spread misinformation about Tesla sales level, like uh, saying that PMW sells more cars than than Tesla uh, with Solar City too before the acquisition of Solar City because he was shorting Solar City before uh, Tesla acquired it, and uh, it was very misrepresenting Solar City's uh, price structure. Saying that they were more expensive than the average cell uh, energy prices in the U.S., which makes no sense because, of course, they are. But so it is not selling energy system to the average um, electricity consumer in, in in the U.S. They are doing it in markets that are more expensive, or where so that they can actually save money by going solar, which is what every solar company has ever done, or every new. Uh, energy system has already done before. Anyway, he, he, he's a, a shady person. We can, I think, we can safely say that he's, he's a shady person. And Elon just went down on, uh, went very deep into the relationship between Lynette Lopez and Chanos. Because if you go back to more article about it, I was, uh, I was skeptical that uh, that's our motive, that's Lopez' motive for for doing those reports. And I'm not defending our reports because. Or reports are clearly uh, they're bad. Like they they're, they're not really representative of uh, of Tesla's manufacturing processes and in, uh, in the company in general. So she she's clearly doing some hit pieces. But Tesla has done that before, like accusing a media outlet or a, a reporter specifically uh, to have like ulterior motives that are like being being a short themselves or being financed by shorts. And I, I don't think that's always the case. Uh, did we talk about that? No, I think we talked it off air. But uh, 
like if you if you if you go back to uh, one of the uh, more notorious short uh, uh, Niedermeyer, what, what's his first name? Uh, Edward Ed. uh, Niedermeyer, Ed, Ed and Niedermeyer, I think. Anyway, he's uh, he's pretty notorious for always attacking Tesla. And if you look at uh, a piece that he's, he's writing about Tesla, it's always negative and trying to to find negative things in, in in anything. Basically, you have news that comes out, you're gonna try to find a negative angle on it. Um, and Tesla, I think it was like in 2015, he came out with like a very bad piece about the, 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 the paint, uh, uh, the, 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 um, a paint department at the Freeman factory. And because of the, uh, application that they had on the number of cars that they could, the volume that they could handle, uh, the, he said, and that was in 2016, I think he said the mall, basically Tesla was lying about the multi production capacity that they were going to handle because they couldn't uh, have the uh, authorization for the emission that they were coming from the paint factory. Anyway, it it didn't make any the report didn't make any sense. Like Tesla could apply for 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 the exemption from uh, for the paint the paint shop, but anyway, when Tesla responded to to the article and uh, that that was after a series of similar article from from Niedermeyer they claimed that he, he was doing it because he was a short or working for the shorts i don't think Niedermeyer is a short on tesla i think he's just so invested in in tesla failing because he's been reporting about that for years i mean at some point he was the editor of the truth about cars and the truth about cars were were running like the tesla debt watch and uh, they were and he was on board with that. He, he, he stated multiple times that he see Tesla failings, uh, that, and that was back like years and years ago. So when you're you're so invested into the, the idea, and your job is being a, an automotive industry reporter or analyst, or I, I don't know what what he, what he calls himself these days, but your credibility is attached to to that. So if if, you, if that's all you comment about every time, so you you're even though if you don't have money behind it, you're invested in the narrative that you're pushing and he's been pushing the narrative that Tesla is failing that alone is a big motivator for for people i think in, in my opinion uh so that that's what i saw like tesla i like, got it wrong with that i think maybe, maybe i'm wrong and maybe he's uh he's actually being paid by shorts uh, i know there's been allegation of him working for like a uh uh a, a conservative think tank and like money being thrown to that and then yeah we got a tip about that uh, yeah yeah Thomas Tipster said to go look at all these little things we probably should we should probably take a look at that stuff um, yeah well i i mean i i think it's pulling at straws really is not, i don't i don't think it's that important of a person for that but tesla did uh made some those allegations against him which i i think weren't fair and now we are seeing a similar thing with lynette lopez here so i was a little bit defensive about that of you know accusing her of that or suspecting that there was a connection with the shorts here and especially jim channels but then after that he went like deep in the social media uh, or social media accounts and her previous post about jim channels and everything which i, w I wasn't aware of that I, w I was aware that she she interviewed jim channels a few times before and she seemed like buddy buddy with him but then you also learned that she she like she write she wrote a post about her uh, jim channels cufflink like on Business Insider, she did a, a whole post just about Jim Channel's cufflink. Uh, she she also posted about receiving like gifts from other hedge funds. Uh, receive uh, she she posted about partying in Las Vegas with Jim Channel. So, so that when you go deeper into it, like it's, it starts to look weird for for like a a reporter to be so close to um, to someone like Jim Channel who benefits from her reporting because. That, that that there's no doubt if you're short on if you're short on tesla which jim channels clearly is then you benefit from uh lynette lopez reporting because if you, you can actually look at lynette lopez post and tesla uh, tesla stock price decreasing after her post because her all her posts are just hit pieces on tesla right and and for her like it's hard to de determine whether she's getting something on the side from either a short or whatever or it's just like business insider clickbait type of you know like any bad tesla news is very yeah. clickbaity so they make their money there um and business insider in general we can agree is is a lot of clickbait like, i don't think anybody's gonna argue that yeah against I, that you mean <laughs> yeah against that i yeah like 
it's just kind of how it is. But um, I I just feel like the like the whole media thing. It, there's like a high level of paranoia at at for for Elon, I guess, and and Tesla, and I think that stems from a couple things. One, you know, they're disrupting the auto industry, so like they feel like the, the whole auto industry wants to destroy them and the dealers as well. Um, there's the oil industry or the, you know, gas and whatever. Um, they don't want te Tesla to succeed. Um, you know, that's, that includes shipping and gas stations and, you know, everything. And then, you know, you have all the energy incumbents. So, you know, if, if Tesla is doing solar, then the, they've got to wor worry about the coal people and the, uh, natural gas people. So pretty much like billion or trillions of dollars of industry is in trouble if Tesla succeeds. So, you know, Elon knows this, Tesla knows this. So with that in the back of their minds, I have to feel like you would be a little bit afraid of like, because these are not like great industries. These are not like <laughs> industries that are that play fair, play fair or like care about the world or, you know, have have moral comp con conscious this this is kind of like the worst of the worst mm -hmm. so you have the worst people with the most amount of money um and you know that they're after you and it, it's got to be a little bit hard to just like day to day like not imagine that some kind of uh scheme is being cooked up behind the scenes to like destroy the company i, I mean yeah. I, well it, i think about that yeah, and it's not like you said it's paranoia, but it, it's that's the thing. It's it's not just paranoia because it, it has been proven. Like there's been campaign against Tesla and uh, against EVs in general, and you can trace it back to being funded by uh, companies and people linked to the oil industry. That, that that's just a fact. We we reported on that on multiple times before, but I mean when that happens. It's generally pretty obvious, like if you if you you're aware of it, like if you if you're someone like us who are in the media industry and especially in EVs, we, we can see it happen. Um, and you can kind of follow the money, you know, like Fortune, yeah. like for instance, uh, uh, the Cox the Coke, Coke, brother. Coke brothers announced that they were going to spend a bunch of money on Fortune, and then a few weeks later, or not even maybe like a week later, there's a big op-ed about how. I don't even remember what it was, but it was a very anti-Tesla op-ed. Right? Uh, anti it was EVs, yeah, it was EVs. It just it was generally... A, it was about, like, EVs being powered by coal or something. You know? Right. Uh, which, theoretically, you know, the Koch brothers should have been Pretty happy with that. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's clear that a lot of the traditional uh, auto industry mags, you know, count uh, oil and traditional car companies as their sponsors. So, uh, you know, th those organizations get a lot of money, uh, typically from, you know, the enemies of Tesla and electric vehicles in general. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising to see such a negative bias, uh, in the traditional media place. Yeah. Yeah. I understand all of that. I just, and I and I'm I'm more suspicious than ever now than the Leonid Lopez link with with, with China's, but I, I'm still not convinced that that's re that's really where it's coming from. I, I I right now I think that the just the clickbait thing is just posting negative t articles about Tesla. He is popular. It makes money. Um, I think that's the more likely explanation, and not so business insider Leonid Lopez was. Elon's main uh, target during that like little tweet storm this week, but he also addressed um, CNBC and the uh, CNBC putting channels on and uh, putting other other uh, analysts that are uh, known to be against Tesla uh, without any m m credibility other than being employed by by one of those firms. Uh, so he addressed that too. But uh, yeah, that wasn't the only uh, people that commented on the. Um, on the production goal, well, that was that was well, that was sort of tried to put some doubts about the production goal because, like Tesla, uh, changed a few things in order to to 
lower quality to increase output. Uh, at least that was the goal, likely of the um, of the article. But the the only one themselves commented on the on the goal or uh, really mocked the, the the we should say. <laughs> uh, what was his name? His name is um, hmm. uh, Steve Hahn of Ford. The uh, oh yeah, the CEO of uh, Ford Europe. Europe for executive when when Elon ended up thousand cars in seven days sort of mocked it for four thousand cars instead of seven days which is true uh for can produce a lot more cars than Tesla no one's gonna agree that but uh can Ford produce seven thousand long range cars in seven days? That that I think is the bigger question. Yeah. Or any like any desirable EVs? Like, can they produce one desirable EV? Oh, you're you're increasing the <laughs> the threshold right. here. <laughs> Not even just uh, I, and I put long range EV too, but I could say like just short range EV either. They don't they don't produce like the. The Ford Focus Electric is not is technically like a short range EV, and you don't you don't even producing that seven thousand in a in a day. So I think Ford is missing the point completely. Like they but, they're they're bragging about their manufacturing capacity, and sure, man, you have great manufacturing capacity. You guys invented the production line as it is today, and uh, over a uh, century ago, yeah, you did that a century ago. And you've been owning that 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 skill for a hundred years at this point. I mean, it's not news at all. No, what really. is news here? What what is impressive here is that Tesla is producing compelling electric vehicles with long range at a rate of seven thousand a year uh, at the seven thousand a week, or at least they did during that last week of the quarter. And no one else has done that before. No one else is doing that now. That's what you, the focus needs to be. Ford needs to see that. As long as Ford doesn't see that, instead mark the goal. I mean, that's just. That's so, very disappointing. So coming from the Apple world, this reminds me a lot of when Steve Ballmer, the CEO, the then CEO of Microsoft, uh, you know, he heard about the iPhone or just, you know, the iPhone was released and, and bought, he had, you know, he's the incumbent. He's like, uh, it's like one of those things where like now it's a, a meme almost where uh, he's like, oh, you know, the, the iPhone costs too much and it doesn't have any apps and, you know, we have like 15 different devices running our OS and uh, you know, that is kind of played back every time somebody says, uh, well, I mean, now I it's been addressed uh, a new product coming out. Yeah. So um, this, this tweet may live in infamy. I, I think yeah. it probably will. Yeah. I, I hope not. I hope they actually see the irony in it. Like it, it all, all looks bad and address it and just, Increase, accelerate their uh, electrification plan because I uh, we, we've said it a bunch of time before, but we're really not impressed by Ford's electrification plan. Ford is a great company uh, uh, at the core of it. I mean, they uh, they managed to survive during the two thousand eight two thousand nine crisis. They they they, they stayed afloat, and uh, the I mean, in terms of the cars they're doing, like uh, of course electric, we're biased about about EVs. So uh, not not electric, not power tra power train aside. They're still doing some good cars, I think. I'm well, yes, and no. I mean, like the new Mustang, I'm not a fan of the recent Mustang. You have to go back a few decades for me to like to like the Mustang. Uh, pickup trucks, I mean, uh, I'm okay with the 150, but um, really not my my top three. It's not even my top three pickup truck at this point. Um, but they have an opportunity to reinvent themselves with electrification and and come up with, with great things, and they're just not right now. They're, they're simply not. Their, their first all-electric vehicle built to be electric from the ground up, not a, not a compliance car that they're converting a, 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 an existing like gas car, cars, like, like the Focus Electric. The first one that they're building from the ground up on a new all-electric platform is coming out in 2020, and it's going to be a CUV. At this point, there's going to be like 10 other CUV electric vehicles on the market. There's going to be like, you know, the Bolt is already like a uh, CUV. GM would like us to call it a CUV, but it's basically yeah. a compact. Um, that is 
bunch but of I mean, cool. the other companies are going to be starting on their Gen two or their you know a few. Yeah. They're going to have all the kinks out of their their system. You know, clearly, like Tesla is going to be releasing some CV type stuff in twenty twenty. So they're not going to be Tesla to that space like uh, I guess Jaguar and um, Hyundai and Kia are all kind of coming out with CEVs right now. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't know where Ford's going with this. They're going to come out with a CEV in 2020 after everybody else has done it and it's not going to sell well. And they're going to be like, well, it's, you know, we told you. Well, that's why we're going. We're going away from cars. We, we want to focus on trucks. And right. they, they, they basically, that's what they said earlier this year. And that's fine for me. I mean, if you don't want to sell passenger cars anymore, don't, don't sell them. Focus on your on your SUVs and, and your pickup trucks, but make them electric. Yeah, it's not hard. I mean, it's actually easier to make uh, uh, trucks electric because or taller cars electric. Yeah. So yes and no. Yeah. I mean, I mean the range. Yeah. Yeah, you have to have a big battery, so you have to have a good battery cost, a battery pack level cost. Right. And how you get there? Mass yep. producing battery packs. Right. So they're gonna. If you make a, a compelling all electric pickup trucks, you have to make it in high volume because you have to make battery packs in high volume, and you have to have a good. You have to either make your own battery cell, or have a very good battery cell contract to maintain that uh, cell cost very low. How many how many miles you need on a pickup? Four hundred, five hundred. That's about. Well, you can have a two hundred miles option. Yeah. Um, I, yeah was just, I, feel- I was just uh, talking about Tesla's. Range. Oh yeah, well last week was all about the Tesla pickup trucks. Right. I'm not gonna get on that this week, but we're gonna say it again. Ford, accelerate your all electric vehicle plans. It's it's, uh, it's weak right now, and uh, you don't look good when you you send out those tweets that completely miss the point. Not about making a lot of cars per week. It's about making a lot of cars that gonna change the world. Right. That's all electric vehicles. Um. What else? Uh, oh, vehicle to grid. That's something we haven't heard about in a while from Tesla. Yeah, that was kind of a, a reply tweet uh, Elon did, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone brought up the fact that you could connect like two cars together to charge them, uh, which you, you cannot really do right now with Tesla vehicles. Uh, and Elon brought up the fact that uh, the uh, the Roadster was able to output power. It basically had the capacity for a vehicle to grid if you had like a bi-directional charger, if you made one or something, the, the, the vehicle itself had the capacity. Uh, and he said, maybe it's worth revisiting that, which is uh, the first positive comment about those vehicle to grid or vehicle to home or vehicle to vehicle um, technology that, that has come out of Tesla in a long time, because that, that's something that they addressed in the past. But uh, it was sort of dismissed on a few different occasions from, from Elon himself and a, a few times from GB Straubel too. Uh, of course, that changed a lot because of Tesla Energy, I think. Like Tesla's focus on uh, having a home energy system like the power wall. So you want to sell that and, instead of, uh, uh, of uh, using your vehicle for that. And there's a there's a good argument to be made about that because like your home battery pack is always at home, so your 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 electric vehicle is not necessarily always when you need it to be, uh, when you need uh, that that on par. The other thing too is that if you use your ba- your vehicle battery pack for uh, home energy purposes. You're gonna get more cycles in your car and your battery pack, and you can accelerate like battery degradation, and, and and that just doesn't look good for Tesla in general because, like, because your car has an additional feature that you could use, uh, it gets more degradation, so like it could be perceived differently. But other people are doing it now, like the new Nissan Leaf has vehicle to vehicle capacity and they are rolling out those bi-directional chargers in a few places um mainly in europe right now uh, well uh, i'm not even sure that the nissan leaf in the us the version us has vehicle to grid capacity i, I might be mistaken yeah i haven't heard about it in north america really i know that they, they have it in europe they have it in japan maybe they're just not talking about it in the us yet because they don't have that bi-directional charger thing um so they, they don't just feature it, but it's actually the capacities in there, which would make sense because I don't think it's like a big deal at the vehicle level. It's more of the 
that you kept asking about. We, we, we ran a, a little survey about it, a whole poll on the post about saying if, if you guys want that vehicle, do you have capacity in Tesla cars? And uh, over, overwhelmingly, people said yes at 86%. Uh, ten percent said they don't care, and about just four percent, uh, three point six percent said no. So there's a lot of stuff you can do. Like so, in, instead of actually sending electricity out to the grid, you can actually just save a lot of electricity by telling it when to charge. Um, you know, if if you tell your car to charge three a.m. to five a.m. every day instead of you know whenever you plug it in. Um, then it's that's, that's con controllable, controllable load, right? And so that obviously shifts a lot of um, energy usage to you know later at night. So these are kind of like passive ways of of shifting uh, the demand on the grid, um, and Tesla can do that already. Um, I think you know Tesla has said this, and it's starting to make sense to me that. Um, for the day-to-day -day stuff, um, it makes sense to to have a power wall rather than have a car because, like, kind of when you need um, the electricity, um, you're you're out. Like, you know, you're t typically at work all day, so um, th there's no way to get electricity out of the car during the day. Uh, you know, or or in the evening, I guess when you get home, like you're theoretically done with your drive, and you probably have a lot less energy. You charging probably. Yeah, so it seems like just the the model of how most people work um, doesn't really make a total huge amount of sense to have it come out of your car, and you know having the the dedicated batteries on a on a power wall make make a lot more sense. Now, if you have a power wall, that I mean, I'm already kind of so we have a ski place in in Vermont, and Vermont has these crazy uh, fluctuations and price of uh, electricity. So a kilowatt hour will go from under 10 cents to over 20 cents, depending on the time of the day. Hmm. And Vermont's pretty progressive in that they will credit you also uh, your net meter by the time of the day. So if you're putting out electricity from your solar panels or your battery during the high, high peak time, you're credited, you know, 21 cents per kilowatt hour that you put out. So you could have a power wall and just nothing else and just um, put out power during the day and suck it up at night and probably pay for your power wall in, in a matter of, you know, a couple of years. Nothing else, you know, no other backup or anything else, just putting the power wall in your house. And that's what, um, you know, you wrote a story uh, this week that was quite popular because Elon Musk tweeted it um, about the uh, Vermont uh, power walls kind of, uh, during the heat wave. Yeah. Yeah. During the heat wave. So I think, you know, this, the stationary storage makes a lot more sense it, but via vehicle to grid would make sense for, for emergencies. Like, mm -hmm. you know, those two or three times a year, uh, where like you, you start getting brownouts and businesses have to shut down and everybody's, you know, nursing homes have no air conditioning. Um, it makes sense. Like when your power goes out, so, because like a power wall will last, you know, a day or so, depending on the size of your house and how many power walls you have. But if you're out for a couple of weeks, it would be nice to have that vehicle to grid. So you could, I mean, a couple of things, one, you know, you, your Tesla will probably keep your house going for a week, know, five to 10 days at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, theoretically you could, uh, drive to a, a supercharger fill up in an hour <laughs> and come back and power your house for another week. If the supercharger is, uh, well, as, I as mean, power. like we're, we're not talking to zombie arm again. We're, yeah. you know, just like the local areas. Well, out. If the power is out for a week, I mean, uh, something bad happened. Like, yeah, I mean, our like power is hur hurricane. Uh, yeah. For hurricane. Sandy, we were out oh. for a week and for, we've, we've been out for a week in two separate occasions here. And, you know, it like things weren't immediately back up, but in two days, like superchargers were working, like all mm -hmm. the superchargers were working. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when if that happens again and we're out for two weeks, it would be nice to like be able to just say, Oh, you know, I'm going to go get some more electricity at the supercharger. I'll be back in an hour with a full car that'll power the house for three or four days.
Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Like, it's a, the the vehicle to grid is mainly a cool feature for backup power in case of emergency. I think the the value is more in the controllable load that you mentioned, like controlling when and where uh, when you can charge, uh, having like a smart charging station that can do that. So, so th that's not really have to do with the car itself. If you have a smart charger, you can do that. Uh, it has to be linked also with the electric utility, so that they can, they have power. To, to to limit it and on your own on your side on the driver's side uh you can you have to put your limit to like uh it, it cannot go lower than this capacity in the car though because i need to get to work or whatever so, so even if you guys want to limit my my charging at some point you cannot if i have like this that that much power needed to uh charge again before i have to leave so so you as long as the driver has some option like that, I think it makes a lot, lot, a lot of sense to to give that uh, capacity to electric utility uh, in return for, for for cash. Of course, you need to uh, the drivers need to have a compensation for that. They they had a few programs like that uh, with BMW in California with the high three owners and uh, was very successful. And I think as the fleet of uh, electric vehicles grow, uh, you're gonna need a lot more of that. Uh, it's gonna start to make a, lot, a big difference when like. EVs reach five, ten percent of the fleet, and and start getting those those numbers. Where um, we posted a, a slide from a presentation from GB Strouble in, in that article that was back in 2014, but he made a, pro a projection for 2019. Excuse me, where he said that uh, he envisioned a, a million Tesla vehicles on the road in 2019, and when with uh, a, a 10 kilowatt charger in all those cars. Uh, it gives it gives a 10 gigawatt of controllable load, which means it never is going never going to happen. But if the million Tesla vehicles are charging at the same time, that's a 10 gigawatt load. Uh, so let's say that if they are all in the same grid, and the electric utility is seeing an overload, they can just that's 10 gigawatt that they, they could automatically get off, potentially get 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 off the the current load and and adjust with that. So that's extremely valuable for an electric utility. Yeah, and, and if they have such power, I mean, it's like that virtual power grid they had in uh, Australia when they they have all the power walls and power packs there. Um, you have kind of not not quite a power, like not quite a virtual big battery, but you have a virtual like siphon to su to stop the the usage of batteries, and also, mm -hmm. you know. You have Tesla knows where its cars are at. So, like, if you're having a problem in upstate New York, like a brownout, you could kind of pull back your charging. And it's interesting because, like, right now we're just like on off. Like, but you know, you could slow down the charging to like, you know, one one tenth the yeah yeah or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I was exaggerating with just the ten gigawatt and pulling it all. You, you, it's it's ten gigawatt that you can play with. You have potential right. to play with. But yeah, like you said, you could adjust it and uh, uh but that i mean that's actually kind of interesting because um you know those those peaker plants they they start up pretty quickly but they start up when when things start you know heading south mm -hmm. but if you have that kind of ability to control it you can kind of fork when you forecast something's coming down you can start slowing the the charge of the cars and never hit that point where you hit need to hit the peaker plant. Exactly. Like those kind of things are kind of a big deal because those peaker plants are really inefficient, really big polluters, yeah. and they're very expensive. Yeah, they are. So the bigger the market share of the electricity market goes to EVs, the more the easier it's gonna be to control that peak, that, that peak load. That's as simple as that. So so we, we start we, we start to to need to look at EVs as being a, a contributor to 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 stabilizing uh, the the electricity market and not just a strain on the uh, market. Right. So next time that that guy who watches Fox News says, "Oh, EVs, you can't have too many EVs, or the grid will go down," yeah. you can kind of just reverse that. Yeah, it's it's completely the contrary. Right. Moving on, I'm going to talk a little bit about Tesla service because we we had a big story about that yesterday. Uh, that uh, scared a few people, uh, rightly so, I think. And even Elon Musk said that it was it, it, it was okay to uh, uh, to complain about it. Um, we reported on the service situation in Norway right now, which is a, a bit uh, a bit scary because uh, we received a ton of reports in the few in the last few weeks, like 
maybe the, the, over the last two weeks, maybe uh, from owners that were at our stories about giving their cars into service, uh, people just uh, ju just trying to get an appointment was was horrible. Like they, they couldn't get a, a fixed date. Uh, they were telling them like it's gonna be months to to get a, an appointment for for things that are like quite serious about the car. It's not uh, like the thing that's, that you need like for the, the door and door doesn't work for example for, in one of the example. Uh, the other example, the guy, the battery pack, the, the car didn't work at all. Like you had to replace the battery pack, and uh, it took it, it took months to get a new battery pack in Norway, uh, which doesn't make any sense. Like first of all, you should already have battery pack in inventory, I think. But um, so we posted a bunch of those stories, and we uh, we we contacted Tesla about it, uh, asked them like what uh, what the hell is going on. Because uh, w what's scary about it is because Norway is sort of a glimpse at the future of other markets because it's the biggest market for Tesla per capita. They have 26,000 Tesla registered in Norway. They have 11 service center uh, servicing them. So you, you sort of get an idea as other market grows per capita uh, that their Tesla fleet, you could have similar issues arising. Uh, so you have to look at Norway for for for, 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 some, for that like, little glimpse of the future, and if there's issue, you need to address them quick before uh, it, it becomes the same situation somewhere else. And Tesla was quite reassuring in their comments about it. They told us that they uh, uh, they knew that it was an issue in terms of capacity, and they were looking to double the uh, the size of the service team by the end of the year. And they already had thirty percent versus last year, so they're getting there. Uh, they're a little bit behind if they want to. They want. They're gonna have to accelerate their hiring in the second half of the year. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, they're gonna bring those uh, mobile service fleets. So in the U.S., that's uh, that's doing the, the difference right now. Uh, you can get your service at home or at work or through Tesla's mobile uh, vans. Oh, they're, they're not just vans now. They also that they have the Model S, like they customize the Model S to fit all the tools in it and everything, which is pretty cool. Uh, they don't have that in Norway yet, or, or maybe they have a few, but the fleet is not very significant. Uh, they wanted the, to increase that a lot during the summer. And Elon Musk said that, that, that right now, it's actually the government that is being an issue for the service vans. And apparently, the uh, road authority issue, uh, the Norwegian road authority are, are need to issue an uh, approval for, for, for the vehicles. I'm not sure why, but uh, they need to. And until they do, the vans are they, they're just parked in the, at Tesla. They cannot get there. Anyway, uh, they're looking to increase the staff. They are putting a digital shift. They think that they are addressing the issue. That's all fine. My only concern with that is that looking at all the reports that I got from the owners there, uh, parts seems to be the biggest issue. I mean, uh, the uh, the staff like it looks like they're under staff for sure, but so that's definitely an issue but the bigger issue seems to be parts like they, they cannot get parts on time parts that should be in inventory or not and I, I don't see how increasing the service staff like more service technicians and would change more uh, would, would change a lot about that i think i think tesla might be uh, needing a, a restructuring of their parts department and uh, increase that a lot yeah and that's that's not just norway uh you know we we hear quite a bit that like I mean, you know, this isn't Tesla's fault, but, you know, somebody wrecks their car and and the estimate is like three months to get it repaired because the part doesn't exist. And, uh, you know, uh, Tesla does outsource uh, some of their body work to third party companies, but those third party companies can't often get the parts that, you know, new front fender, new whatever. Um, I know when, you know, I hit I hit a, a ice curb and uh yeah, my car was gone for I think almost three weeks, and which really, is actually good in terms of body yeah, shop. Yeah, it shop. is. It is good, but it would have been two days if they had the part. Yeah, yeah. That that's my concern with it because you mentioned the body shop issue. When all the body shop happened last year, like uh, all the uh, the long wait time when the body shop came to light, the third party body shop. Um, Blame Tesla for the parts uh, taking times. Tesla blamed the body shop for not doing the work on time and whatever. So they said, "Oh, now we're gonna have our own body shops and whatnot." 
But now this service thing, like they, they cannot blame the third party. Those are Tesla service centers and Tesla parts. So if the parts are an issue there and they might have been in the body shop, I'm starting to see a, a pattern here. So yeah, I, I would have liked Tesla to say something about the parts. Uh, for their own body shop, they said that they're going to take the parts in inventory. So that might that was the thing. But I don't know if the third party shop didn't want to hold inventory because it's uh, it's a cost to them. So I don't, I don't know if that was an issue there. But that that's that, that cannot be an issue with the Tesla service center. So so I don't know. Uh, Tesla says that you're going to start seeing a difference in Norway for if we have uh, Norway listeners. We, we're going to keep an eye on it, make sure that it happens. Otherwise, we're going to crack down on them again. Uh, moving on, ah, another bad news this week. Tesla SVP of engineering, that Phil, is gone. So if you remember back in May, we reported that he was going on leave. Uh, clear that he was just going on leave and he wasn't leaving the company at that, at that time. But now it was confirmed this week that uh, he's not returning from leave. Uh, he's leaving He's leaving the auto. Oh, I think I lost you. No. Oh, I see you on the feed. But anyway, um, I don't know if you can hear me. So, yeah. Are you right now? Okay, good. So, Doug Field uh, came from Segway, then Apple. Uh, where he was in charge of Mac hardware, Segway, obviously a mobility company, but um, different kind of mobility company. Uh, seemed like a pretty cool guy. Like uh, he gave me the uh, uh, Model S, uh, I think it was the D event um, with the ludicrous mode, uh, the test drive insane there, mode. which was insane mode, which was, which was in insane. Um, <laughs> you know, the first time in, you know, you can hear me on the on the YouTube, like mm. my chest cave, caving in. Um, so that was kind of cool. Like I would, you know, and I didn't talk to him about Apple too much, but um, he seemed like a nice guy. Uh, I know other employees liked him. Um, it sounds like uh, the Model Three uh, ramp up got a little, uh, you know, kind of oh, probably got a little crazy. Um, so you know, there were reports that um, that Musk denied that uh you know he kicked him out of the model 3 production uh lineup uh because you know it wasn't happening or wasn't getting done um so you know good luck to doug field uh he's a big part of the last i don't know five or so years of tesla mm -hmm. um yeah it's you know it's kind of a bummer to see like the turnover on uh people that you you know, formed a little bit of a relationship with. Um, so that's kind of a bummer. Yeah. I mean, Phil, Phil like, yeah, cannot be one of those exact that Tesla says that it's just regular turnover or whatever, because like just a few months before he left, like Musk said that he was, I'm quoting, one of the world's most talented engineering execs. So, I mean, yeah. you, you don't let someone like that go normally. So uh, it looks like he might have been a, a bit of a work at Tesla. Uh, when, when he left, um, Tesla said in a statement that he was uh, uh, he was taking some time off to recharge and spend some time with his family. So it sounds like after doing that, he says, ah, do I really need to go back there and, uh, and kill myself uh, working 60 hours a week or whatever? Uh, right. we, we wish him the best of luck and we thank him a lot for all his work on the Model 3, which I hope I'm going to like when I get it in the next few weeks or months or yeah when whatever. is your when is your delivery date this it still says only uh august to october so i don't okay. know i don't have a vin yet it's not it's not in production okay it's confirmed and everything so we're gonna see but uh, um yeah so i i i don't know if that um so we know also we got word or we heard that um, some other executives were on leave. Uh, we heard that they were from on family leave. Um, but Tesla said that, uh, actually we heard people had left and Tesla said that, no, they're just going home uh, for their family for a couple months. So hopefully those guys really are on 
uh, family leave. Yeah, not. a source says that it's not the case at all. I cannot confirm it with a second source yet, but for this specific person that you're thinking about, uh-huh. uh huh, doesn't look good. Okay, so that that's kind of a bummer. From mm -hmm. the PR is kind of steering us the wrong way, but um, it's not it's not somebody integral. There's no, it's not a huge person. Well, yeah, he's he's known, but yeah, he's known, but not like. If we can confirm oh, okay. it, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna confirm it. So, um, lastly, we're gonna leave you with a little note of encouragement for the the GM Chevy Bolt EV. The EV is important, people. The EV is important. Everyone calls it the Chevy Bolt, but it's the Chevy Bolt EV to make the difference with the Volt. Uh, J GM sucks with their, <laughs> their EV naming scheme. That's not great. <laughs> but they're gonna increase the production. If you guys remember a while back, uh, back in March, yeah, back in March, uh, uh, GM CEO Mary Barra said that they were going to increase the, the Chevy Bolt EV production, but she didn't specify any details. She just said going to increase it. Cool, but like when and how, by how much? Now they say by twenty percent during the fourth quarter. So three months later, they confirmed that now they aim to increase it by twenty percent in the fourth quarter. The why the, the long delay? I, I think the long delay is because of the of, of LG uh, LG Cam and LG is involved in a lot of uh, the production of the um, of the Shibuya TV, so they have to make sure they are able to increase the production before they can. And uh, now apparently they are okay for the uh, fourth quarter. Twenty percent of how many cars though? That's the question. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm thinking it's a, it's about twenty four thousand units, like it's about two thousand units a month right now. So with twenty percent, it's like it, it, it's a, it's a good four hundred units per month, something like that. Not huge, not insignificant either. Uh, there's being like there's a backlog now, like in Canada alone, the backlog is apparently a, a year for so that could help. You could. You know what I just that. realized, Fred? Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about the federal tax credit at all. We didn't. Oh well, we're gonna do it in a second, and we're gonna right. run a little later if we. Uh, yeah, we skip that. So yeah, uh, well, that, that's basically it for 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 the Shiva Bolt TV anyway. Uh, it's gonna come in two or three new colors. We also learned earlier. Yeah, we did already talk that's about that. The 2019 version is gonna be awesome with uh, two more color, including one that's just the worst. Um, but yeah, they failed to ask you this. What, what we're gonna we want to talk about this week is um, first of all, we're pretty sure that Tesla already hit it. The mark, the two hundred thousand mark, during this quarter, like you could could have done it the first week already, uh, but it doesn't matter anyway. If you do it now, do it in three weeks and four weeks. Uh, uh, doesn't when they hit in the quarter doesn't affect anything else for a quarter. Uh, what so what we but what's bothering us is that Tesla is not confirming it. And we we asked them, we asked them a few times. They don't want to confirm it, and uh, what they say to their salespeople is just that. The, the 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 company line is just tell the uh the buyers that uh they have to cons uh, to to check with their tax people uh the tax accountant and uh, see if uh their tax return and the, the the tax credit work with the tax return and uh that's it as if the tesla doesn't have any power over it and they do that when they deliver the 200,000 mark is the most important thing yeah it's super important and it's funny because i actually called the irs and had like some pretty long conversations with a few people there about uh, Tesla and, and actually I more general about EV makers. Um, so if you go on the IRS website, you can see Ford, I think Mercedes and another company's actual numbers and they report them every quarter. Um, and so you know exactly when Ford and Mercedes and uh, this other automaker are going to hit 200,000. Um, Is it BMW? I think BMW. Yeah, maybe it's BMW. Um, you know what? Maybe it's not BMW because I, I that would have been kind of interesting to me. And I remember these three were not interesting. <laughs> um, and it's not Nissan. Uh, so so Nissan, uh, GM, uh, Tesla all hide their numbers. Uh, they haven't signed a waiver to be transparent with with the American people. And it's particularly frustrating for Tesla and I guess GM too, knowing that you're planning your car decision, buying a car decision with Tesla, you, you know, you're planning, you know, maybe up to a year in advance. Um, and you don't know how much you're going to get back in, and in, in your tax money. And 
you know, it at some point it's going to drop from 7,500 to 3,750. And, you know, Tesla won't tell us if they've hit 2,000 yet and that the IRS won't tell us unless Tesla uh, signs this transparency agreement. Um, but the problem is, is like, you know, like I said, like, you can't buy a Tesla right now. Or you can't buy a Tesla Model 3 right now and just, you know, know where you're at. Um, it's even worse because you don't even know when you're going to get your Tesla. So it's, you know, maybe it's a year from now. If you're buying a new Tesla Model 3 and you want to get the $3,500 one, there's a lot of people out there who want to do that and that they, ha they have that question and Tesla's not providing that answer. I wonder if they still haven't hit 200,000 because once they hit 200,000, you know, that's it. But I'm, I'm afraid that Tesla may have already hit 200,000. Maybe they hit it last quarter and they don't well, want to say when well, they pass it. Yeah. But that, that's even worse. If they hit it last quarter and they don't tell anyone, uh, there's no excuse for that. That, that. Yeah, that would be bad. Yeah, I, I, I completely don't get it. Anyway, the, the other reason why we wanted to talk about it this week is because um, Tesla, uh, no, not Tesla, but there's actually an effort to remove that 200,000 threshold of delivery in the US. Um, uh, Vermont did, did we, uh, guy. Did we, did, did, did we explain the, the phase out period? No, I, I mean, we have in the past, but the phase out period is yeah. well, the quarter you hit it is fine and the quarter after it you still get 7500 then it drops down to 3750 then it drops down again to like 1800 yeah so basically if tesla hit hit it during the this quarter which we think is is has already happened or is going to happen uh you still get the seven uh seven thousand five hundred for the rest of the year then starting 2019 it's going to be for the first half of the year 3500 and uh the second half is going to be uh 1750 but there's a new effort to remove that completely and go on the time-based thing, which makes a lot more sense than pretty much every other country is doing, well, every other country that has incentive because it, it just makes more sense. Um, especially since the two first people that are going to hit the number are going to be Tesla and GM, two American automakers. And then what happens is that once you hit that number, uh, people who haven't hit the number or become more competitive for electric vehicles because they, they and the only reason for that is because they were late to market with their cars so you benefit uh automakers that were late to market for a certain time so that that's kind of stupid so that's the argument behind uh removing that but the problem is that they are replacing it with a 10 year period which i think is too ambitious especially for a, a congress that's controlled by republicans who uh just a few months back, suggested to remove the incentive altogether. Yeah, it was almost gone. Yeah, yeah, it was almost gone a few months ago. And now you want to try to make it so that uh, it's going to last for 10 years? <laughs> I think that's a little bit too ambitious. I mean, a, a few years would make a big difference, I think. Uh, and, and it would be a lot more fair for everyone so that you don't negatively affect uh, early adopters uh, of the uh, electric powertrain technology. So maybe it's just a negotiation thing because it was just introduced this week uh, or last week in, in Congress and a, a, a bill in the Senate is going to be introduced too. It's uh, Peter Welch. If you guys want to give him a pat on the back, it's uh, Peter Welch from, from Vermont um, who's um, who's pushing for it right now. But uh, there's someone else also in the, in the Senate that's doing the same. Maybe it's just a negotiation tactic. They're gonna go for ten years now, and they're gonna like cut it to five or whatever. Yeah, usually that's how Congress or our Congress works is they compromise on like a year or something or two years or whatever, just to keep it alive. So that'd be nice. Uh, that made a big difference for Tesla, uh, Tesla buyers especially, and uh, GM buyers too. And it's gonna piss off a few people in the rest of like Hadi, for example, which doesn't sell many EVs. And they're gonna come out with the Tron Quattro on the on the market, and it would have been a lot more competitive if they get the seven the the, the seven thousand five hundred and the Model X doesn't get it. That would have been a bit difference for them. Uh, but I think it's gonna happen anyway. That's that's what's gonna happen, most likely. It's just gonna run out. I think maybe not. Maybe I'm too pessimistic. 
let us know what you guys think and uh thanks a lot for listening and thanks a lot for patreon supporting our patreon.com slash electric for helping us every month uh thanks a lot for everyone that reads uh electric and listen to the podcast that's uh awesome too and uh, we're gonna see you next week bye-bye